To get this out of the way for anyone who's been paying attention to my content warnings, yes, depression and suicide are a common topic on this channel, and I think I need to address that especially before going into this video. I don't bring this topic up frequently to bully people away from my videos who can't handle it. I bring it up constantly because my own depression forces me to think about these morbid things on a constant basis. Sometimes I use these thoughts for videos, and so far that's turned out reasonably well in my eyes. Sadness is not the most effective brain germ out there, but judging by my short videos and a regular upload schedule, you should be able to deduce that this is less about clicks in YouTube's algorithm and more about going in an unfiltered creative direction. On that note, art reflects its creator, and while I'm not exactly prepared to pompously call my videos art, I do need to remind my audience that these videos reflect me, and they're a part, if not an extension of, my own mind space. With that said, I must make a point about morbid politics and curiosity. Through the experience I've had with observing behavior of both left and right-wing extremists, I've noticed that their focus is more so on something I call morbid politics. The centrists they're an antithesis to believe in less extreme worldviews due to their assumption that the world's problems are less immediate or common than they really are. Centrists can suffer from the just world phenomenon by making the base assumption that really bad scenarios are uncommon, or that the world is fair and just and that things will just pan out. Political extremists, such as communists, however, will present an extreme problem with the world like capitalism and push the severity of the issue with many tidbits of shock factor information. For instance, the left had a morbid fascination with the story of Shane Patrick Boyle, a man who died because he couldn't raise enough money on GoFundMe for the last $50 worth of his life-saving insulin. This wasn't a simple headline either. This story includes how Shane didn't ask family members or parents for help since it's embarrassing to be poor in this country, and since Americans are stubborn about getting help for their problems. It even got to the point where a leftist artist on the nib created a comic as homage to Shane since he was a close friend of theirs. This whole story about Shane Patrick Boyle isn't cited by leftists in vain. It's used as a larger point to say that many other people under the American healthcare system suffer similar fates. It's a way for people to, in a sense, feel numbers. I can tell you that 45,000 people die a year from lack of healthcare in America, but that doesn't really mean a lot on its own. It takes a morbid story to get you to better understand why this number should be a huge problem. While this system of morbid politics is effective at pushing some people away from the egocentric, just world phenomenon, it has major downsides for the pundits heavily involved in it. Doesn't matter if you're a morbid Nazi or communist intellectual, the hyper-awareness of your politics will push you to a higher likelihood of depression since you now yearn for a society that feels like it's light years away. Perhaps to your dismay, this video is going to be centered around a morbid story. The title of this video, Death by Work, is as literal as it gets. Like other morbid intellectuals, I choose to share this story because I have opinions and I have an awareness to push. This is the story of Red Ataraxia. Red Ataraxia was a Reddit user who posted in subreddits such as r slash depression and r slash suicide watch with his work-related struggles. I happened to come across one of their posts when it was screenshotted on r slash anti-work. The OP first mentioning how scarily accurate the post is, and then mentioning Red Ataraxia's unfortunate passing by suicide a year after the aforementioned post. The screenshotted post was Ataraxia's response to an undisclosed topic called Misery in Terms of the 40-Hour Workweek, and their response reads as follows. You and me, I think we're the exact fucking same. I have an hour-long commute. I have to wake up at 5 a.m., leave at 6 a.m., and be in by 7. I leave at 3 p.m. and make it home by 4. I have to go to bed at 9 p.m. in order to wake up the next day not feeling like tired shit because the human body is a disgustingly inefficient thing. The instant I get home at 4.30 p.m., my mind goes into timer mode. I start counting the hours, the minutes, sometimes even the seconds. I have exactly four and a half hours to do the things I want to do before I have to go back to the slog the next day. I need to cram that time with as much of the things I want to do as possible. My weekends are the same. I wake up and I start counting. Saturdays are less of a problem usually because I wake up when I want and go to sleep whenever I want, but it's still there casting a shadow over everything. I get one day, one day out of seven where I don't feel stressed out about waking up when I have to and sleeping when I have to. And when Saturday starts, I have 12 or 14 or 16 hours before Sunday. When Sunday starts, I have until 9pm until my weekend is over. When the 40 hour work week starts to get to you like it does to me, you start feeling stifled for time, and the paycheck you receive starts feeling worthless, because it's not like you can use that money to buy the time back. This is your life, and in one hour, one minute, one second at a time for 40 hours a week, maybe even more. If anyone asks you out, whether it's your SO or your friends, your parents, anyone, even if your relationships with them are happy and healthy, your brain can't help but make an automatic calculation. How much of my time will this take? How much will I have left until I have to go back to work? 
And when even the slightest thing goes wrong, if you forgot to get something at the store, if there's traffic, if someone makes a mistake and costs you more time, you start to resent it. You resent that delay. And the people who cause that delay for wasting the precious free time you have. And every hour, every minute, every second that slips away is time that you don't get to spend doing the things you want to do. Things you used to enjoy no longer provide the same fulfillment because you can't stop that clock. You can't stop counting the hours, the minutes, the seconds. Even if you're enjoying yourself, even if you're having a blast and accomplishing a lot, even if at the end of the day you feel like a champion who's closer to your dream, that shadow is there, telling you that you only have this many hours, this many minutes, and this many seconds left until you go back, like a guillotine slowly inching its way towards your neck. And when you're having fun, that realization causes you to get jerked back into the real world. Hey fucker, have a good time? I hope you did, because it's another 40 hours until you can even start to get that back. Now start lifting, jackass. Your life doesn't become yours until we say it does. My job doesn't suck. The work is nothing special, if a little tiring, but it's not murdering me. I work at a good company. My coworkers are good people. My boss is a pretty understanding guy who always tries to be fair and helps out when he can. My pay isn't anything stellar, but it's livable, and some people would envy having it, $20 an hour. But I get the sense that I'd feel like this with the vast majority of work. 40 hour work weeks, no matter what, get tedious, become meaningless, burn me out. The only way I can avoid it is to not work a day in my life, to do a job that I love. But how many people get jobs they love? How many people get paid livable wages, enough to have a room and food, doing what they love? How many people even know what it is that they love to even pursue in the first place? The fact that the starving artist is a running joke in America, someone going hungry trying to do what they love, is the cruel reality. And the fact that we're okay with it and point and laugh with everybody else, even fake laughter, is the cruelest reality imaginable. You want to do what you love? Fuck you. That's not how the real fucking world works, shit heel. Now hop to it. You got 40 hours of work to do, and if you want to fucking eat, you better fucking do it. I'm reminded of that movie In Time starring Justin Timberlake. It's a movie about a dystopian future where money has no meaning, and people trade time. A coffee might cost 30 seconds, a cab fare might cost 2 minutes, and a high quality mountain bicycle might be 4 months. A new sedan might be 9 years. There's a watch everyone has embedded in their arm that tells them how much time they have, and when that number reaches zero, they die. Some people have hundreds of years of time, some people live minute to minute. That's what I feel like. That some people have the rest of their lives to look forward to with their 90 years of time, and here I am scraping by with only a few hours on my clock every day before that clock hits zero and I die. And in America, you can't talk to anyone about it. Nobody at all. Not really. Because even if some individual people might sympathize and wish they had less working hours alongside you, society will think of you as a lazy piece of shit who just wants to mooch off of others. All because you're not willing to surrender 40 hours a week, 160 hours a month, 1,920 hours a year for a paycheck. And you have to convince yourself that you need this paycheck. That you need this money in order to not get fucked in the ass by taxes and bills. You try... You try so hard to justify it. You need this money. You need to give up those 40 hours to live. This is necessary. You try. But it doesn't work. Not really. Not until it's too late. I've been trying to search for a job where I can work from a home office, but for someone like me, there's no options. Everything requires more schooling, more experience, and getting schooling or experience requires time and money I don't have and can't get. And even then, I've only been at this job for a few months. I can't quit yet because I need to stay long enough for it to look good on my resume. I know drugs will make it worse, alcohol will make it worse. The most I can do is to try to anesthetize myself from the activities that I used to like, activities that used to give my life meaning and purpose. I used to enjoy these things, but now the most these things can give me, these things I used to love and enjoy, is a distraction, a temporary illusion that I'm not miserable, which wears off at 9pm every day. There's a light at the end of the tunnel, and I can only hope it's a train. Now, a lot of the comments on this post are similar, talking about how it's relatable or this guy sounds exactly like me. I'm not going to sit here and say every single working person feels like Red Ataraxia does, but my point is, is that a large portion of them do. Many workers are disengaged with their work, and some really can't get much done since the hours are so daunting. And on the topic of daunting hours, it's a strong belief of mine that the 8 hour workday doesn't work. The triple eight rule, eight hours of sleep, eight hours of work, and eight hours of play, looks good on paper, but in the real world, absolutely crushes people. This rule doesn't account for the time allotted for play that we spend on work or self-maintenance, such as our daily commute or just getting ready for work. What you have left over, that is, if you have the energy to use it after a long day of work, isn't much anyways. 
This all comes back to the essay I just recently narrated called Your Lifestyle Has Already Been Designed. It's the philosophy that we are now in a culture that steals most of your time to forcibly shift you from lengthy, cheap, and wholesome activities to expensive, quick, and not so fulfilling ones. If you don't quite understand what I mean, it's worth giving my narration a listen. In Red Ataraxia's case, this lack of time led to an anxiety that surrounded it, counting the hours, minutes, and sometimes even seconds of a day just to get activities and whatnot done. Funnily enough, I found this part really relatable. During every single one of my mornings where I have to get to work, I almost have an intense anxiety with the amount of minutes I spend on making my breakfast, or getting ready, or scraping my windshields, because that's something people in cold places have to do. It. Fucking. Sucks. Even during my weekends, I almost feel ashamed that the hours go by so quickly, and I feel as if I always didn't get enough fun out of my weekends. Only for them to be over, and then having to do a week of work just to get another crack at it only to do the exact same fucking thing, with some minor differences based on the amount of energy I end up having that weekend. So, this is a sloppy conclusion. Hell, this is a sloppy video. I kinda wanted to get one out, and depression has been kicking me in the ass, because of course it is. Anyways, I wish I had solutions, or a cure to this problem. But time is just one thing we can't get back in this world. And if we try, it's really difficult. Going on your own creative ventures, or trying to be self-dependent, is super hard so I can't just expect everyone to do that. As I said in the beginning, this video is more about morbid politics, and giving you a sense of some of the horrible things that happen to people out there to hopefully make you more passionate about the groups of people who are trying to find solutions or are trying to work on them. For me, I found those people are always comrades on the left, but even more moderate people like union members understand these things very well. Either way, I hope you found something useful in this video. Maybe someone to relate to or maybe a better understanding of the chains we all have.